You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached the age of 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. I have a great guest, uh, Rob Taub. He's had an eclectic career in film, television, radio, and journalism. Uh, he's interviewed probably far more people than I have, high-end people, pop stars to presidents. Besides the, the news world, the media world, um, he's an advocate for type 2 diabetes. He's a diabetes advocate and obesity advise, uh, ambassador. So that's what I want to focus on today, not just his uh, media career, but um, his work in that area. So, Rob, welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Good to be here. Thank you. Yeah, and usually people don't focus on health issues unless, unfortunately, they've had a personal experience with poor health and overcoming it or at least managing it. So if you don't mind, what's your uh, how does diabetes impact you in your life? Well, it runs in my family, and my mother... Well, uh, over 10, uh, 12, 13 years ago, I uh, died at age 73 from complications of diabetes. And uh, like many people, she's what doctors, she was what doctors called non-compliant. She was overweight. She smoked cigarettes. She, she ate whatever she wanted. And when she found out she was diabetic and she became type one, she just continued her bad diet, but shot up loads of insulin. And it eventually led to real pancreatic failure. She got pancreatic cancer, which which led to her death. And something like that is far more common than we realize. And uh, as for myself, as a family member then, I was younger, I was in great health. I, I exercised regularly. So what whatever health issues I ever ran into in regard to weight, I was just able to exercise off. I ran a lot. So if I felt like, oh, I've gained a couple pounds recently, I'll just I'll add another mile to my morning run. That'll burn it off. And little did I realize, I you know, that's only going to last so long. If if we could always exercise our weight off, we'd we'd be doing it for our entire lives. But nonetheless, I just I, I, despite my mother being a diabetic and suffering the worst repercussions possible from it, uh, I really learned nothing about the disease and uh, eventually succumbed to it myself a few years later, and it was a life changer. Oh, man, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, yeah, it's, I, I've heard the expression, you can't out-exercise what you can put in your mouth. And, no, and, uh, and it's, I mean, once you, you know, once you have diabetes, I mean, there are world-class athletes who are diabetic and they're type one because they're born that way. And it, it's more a, a lack of understanding and knowledge, especially in our country right now, in, in, in terms of how our bodies work. And now I am a, a legitimate ambassador for a new joint venture between the American Heart Association and the American Diabetes Association called No Diabetes by Heart, K-N-O-W, No Diabetes by Heart dot org. And uh, they've come together and, and brought four, four ambassadors together. One of them is, is me and Angela Bassett, the actress, is our lead ambassador and 
uh, a, a big spokesperson for us, but we're we're there to work in conjunction with with both organizations to educate people about diabetes and heart disease, and uh, because diabetes is growing literally at an epidemic rate right now. I've heard it's growing. Um, I mean, like so anecdotally, I'm in my 40s, and I remember the movie The Goonies, and they had that guy Chunk, and he was like the token fat kid. But back then, you'd have a token fat kid. Now it seems like everywhere I look, including myself, people are way overweight. It's everywhere. Well, I I love the fact that you use the expression "fat kid" because I'm 63 and I write about this and speak about this frequently. And an organization I won't shall not name wanted me to speak at one of their conferences, but they were upset that I used the expression "fat." And I said, "Sorry, but at one point I gained 60 pounds and I was fat." And I don't fat shame people. I didn't fat shame myself. But we also have to acknowledge that right now in America, I think one third of our, our adult population is obese. And so when I was growing up in the 60s, in elementary school, you literally, let's call it an overweight kid. But back then, it's like the teachers would say, you know, you got one fat kid in every class because you had kids that had very little television probably listen to more radio then than we did watch TV. And so you were active as opposed to today's youth, which lead a much more sedentary lifestyle. So diabetes is growing explosively among juveniles and juvenile diabetes is accelerating at a breakneck pace. Yeah, and that's terrible. I have kids and um, same thing. I'm trying to get in the move and exercise and go out. And it scares me. I've spoken to a few pediatric pediatric um, diabetes doctors and the fact that they even have a patient population to care for is, is crazy, but yeah, it's exploding. I see it too. So I just did this really interesting conference in Philadelphia about a month ago uh, called scientific sessions. And it's literally the largest medical pharmaceutical conference in the world. There were 20,000 people attending and I was fortunate enough to be asked to be the moderator of a panel of two of the the premier cardiologists in the world. And my fellow ambassador, who, who is an educator, Hyvel Ferguson was with us, and she was on the panel as well. She brought up a really good point, which which I've touched on in a, in a different way. It's that, that if parents told their kids better things anecdotally, like my mother used to go, eat your vegetables, they're good for you. you know, and of course, I'd never listened. If my mother might have said, You'll score 30 points in the basketball game if if you eat this, or you could score more touchdowns, or you could beat up Johnny who lives next door who's the bully. Maybe I would eat in the broccoli. And Hyvel took that a step further in talking with these cardiologists about, you know, what is a heart attack? Why do we get them? What does it mean? Like when I was a kid, I thought a heart, you know, my grandfather had a heart attack. I was thinking like, what are they, like Roman warriors coming, like, you know, with swords to attack his heart? And she she said, you know, why don't we have things pictorially when a doctor should educate people more in saying, look, I'm not going to explain a breakdown of what happens or what the, this is. This is how your arteries get clogged. This is what happens when you eat too much bad food and, and junk food and, and too much red meat. And it builds this plaque up and, and literally show us. And, give, you know, I think we we respond more pictorially than anything else and you can really see and you can start it with kids like this is what's happening to your insides you know and terrorize the kids a little bit that way you know it's true i got an anatomy book recently because i just i'm interested in biology and i looked for instance at the appendix i never knew what it looked like where it was or any of that and i thought i said to my wife you know i bet you anyone that has their appendix out or has a problem never has shown a picture of what it is where it is and the size and shape and like Simple things about the body, I didn't even know. I didn't. I think most people don't even know like where their organs are. So they definitely need this pictorial stuff. It's true. Yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, honestly, all I know about the appendix and anyway is, is, you know, we don't use it anymore. And supposedly it was some kind of secondary stomach for when we were more Neanderthals and we ate like bark off of trees or something. But uh, yeah, um, I. I, my, my, this is digressing a little. My great uncle, Sam Taub, was the uh, Madison Square Garden boxing ring announcer. So I grew up around boxing. 
And I, <laughs> the only reason I knew like what the liver was and where it was was because in boxing, if you're a really deadly puncher and you hit to the body, you, you could be called a liver puncher. And if you ever get like hit square in the liver, it's like one of the most <laughs> agonizing things that could happen to you. So it's my father being the sweetheart that he was is like, yeah, listen, if you really want to hurt somebody to fight, punch him right here. You hit him in the liver. But, you know, what? what is the function of the liver? What does it do? How do different foods affect it? I'm just, in my dotage, I'm learning about that and, you know, how how alcohol affects it, how certain food affects it, because a liver is, is involved uh, in conjunction with your pancreas and if you're if you're a diabetic and uh, it's what's producing the sugar and uh, you know it, it's it, we're we're really negligent in learning about our own bodies we know about our fantasy football teams uh, but we don't know how how our bodies function and and specifically as individuals what's you know what's your blood work like yeah exactly I've, I've been getting my blood work done now every six months and putting it in Excel and looking at what goes up, what goes down, and supplementing to keep stuff in balance. I mean, that's like a big, you know, my doctor was like, wow, I haven't seen anyone do that. I'm like, come on, man, that's not a big deal. You know? That's a simple thing. Yeah, it's like uh, I look at my blood work now pretty frequently and, and look at it in comparison and see, you know, because there's always going to be like sometimes my tri- triglycerides go up and I'll I'll try to address that. But I do... I, I've, I've become more proactive in, and this is what I really suggest people do before I see my doctor, I Google things so that I know about the different medications and drugs that are available to me as a diabetic and as somebody with high blood pressure and what are the different side effects? I mean, it's not like I should necessarily be expecting my doctor to explain this to me for two hours. So like I do my due diligence beforehand the way what somebody would do before they see their financial planner. I mean, people are that, that have money in a 401k are always looking at the stock market to see how their, how their 401k or their investments are doing. Well, why shouldn't we look at stuff then that's, that's going to affect our literal lives, not just our financial lives. And yet people don't do that. Yeah, one last boxing reference. I've I've heard of kidney punches, by the way. So maybe yeah, that's illegal. Before. You could hit, you could punch somebody in the liver if you hit them in the kidney, and you could get disqualified. But yes, and you know, it's the kidney disease is, is is rampant too. Again, we could get into an into an area I love discussing, which is about fad diets. Um, I wrote a a really right. great piece for a. Uh, um, Thrive Global, which is Aria, Anna Huffington's not, it's three years old now, so it's her latest venture, but it was called Beware of Snake Oil Salesmen. And I, because I, I, I'm always fascinated by people that I'll run into that will tell me, you know, hey, you're a diabetic, you know, uh, y- there's a vitamin you could get. And yeah, yeah, I've seen it on, on the internet and, you know, it's, it's uh, 70 bucks a month and it'll cure your diabetes and you won't have to take any more uh, pharmaceutical medications. And I'm like, y- you think companies like Merck and Pfizer and AstraZeneca and Novo Nordisk, if, if such a thing existed, they wouldn't have it. If there was a cure to diabetes, you know, we'd, all diabetics would be taking it. And that struck me with the idea of like, yeah, you know, this guy's a snake oil salesman. So I, I didn't even know what a snake oil salesman was, and I Googled it. And they came about in the 1870s and literally sold phony elixirs that they said were from the oil of snakes. And so I thought, okay, in 1870, we had snake oil salesmen. We didn't have running water or cars or any kind of sophisticated medical treatment or phones or anything else. And today we have all these things. We've been to the moon, but we still have snake oil salesmen. And, oh, that's true. With, and, and it's, it's a big problem with people in terms of listening to, instead of listening to me, how I lost my weight and I became healthy, they'll go, yeah, but there's this book out that, you know, I saw somebody on such and such a TV show and they uh, said, I'll lose, uh, you know, 50 pounds in two months. And well, how, if you like the pure protein diets, those are, that's how people are ending up getting kidney damage because your kidneys can only process so much protein. And 
you know, none of, and, and none of these diets are something you can stay on forever, but instead of listening to a rational explanation of making a lifestyle change, you have people that will be like, yeah, I'm going to try this. I'll buy this book for 37 bucks and maybe the vitamin supplements that I can order uh, along with it for extra money and uh, everything will be great. Um, what, being on the inside of this now, not only unfortunately as you know a patient, but working with these ambassadors, being an ambassador yourself, like, do you have any insider knowledge on diabetes that surprised you or you think would re- was really helpful to you in managing it? Yeah, just that a lot of it is genetic, which uh, I've come to learn. I work a lot with Dr. Evelyn Grenieri, who's head of the geriatrics department uh, at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. And uh, interestingly, geriatricians, the, the youngest age of most of their patients are about, is, starts at 85. So as she always says, you know, she has to know more about about people's bodies and their illnesses than other doctors, because if you're 40 and you're going to, a, you know, your primary care doctor, there's maybe going to be one or two things wrong with you. By the time, by the time you're 85, you, know, you, you have 10 different ailments. And uh, she says that genetics play a, a huge part of it. But what, what I've come to find is uh, it's, it's a combination for me of diet exercise and prescription medication. And I, I, not to get political, but I think there's way too much of a demonization of big pharma in our country right now, uh, as, as making you know, pharmaceutical companies out as, as these horrible evil oppressors. And I, you know, I grew up in the sixties and the seventies when we, we placed that, that, uh, that moniker on the oil companies and yeah, you know, do, uh, pharma companies make a lot of money? Yes. Do they have people researching, trying to cure cancer, diabetes, and, uh, you know, heart disease, uh, altruistically and, you know, their whole careers? Yes. And so, uh, I, I mean, I, I couldn't survive without any of those three. If I led the life of a saint and ate a perfect diet, I, and I didn't have medication, I, I would be a sick guy. And, uh, um, I mean, I, I, the scientific sessions that I just did in, uh, in Philadelphia, <coughs> excuse me, one of the cardiologists pointed out that it, 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 how, how many people require blood pressure medication today. And once you reach a certain age, they're often a combination of three, as he called them, agents you might take. But, you know, in my grandfather's era, he died in 1966 at age 66. There are very few prescription medications, and, uh, and and people smoked regularly. They didn't know that much about diet, and you know, having a massive coronary at, at age 66, then you were cooked. Uh, today, you know, my father at 66 had a massive coronary, but he was able to get a bypass. Now, my generation. I'm 63. I don't think I'll be a candidate for a coronary in three years because I, I take a, a statin. I have a better diet and I exercise a lot more than my father ever did. So, uh, and, but the medications make make a huge difference. And I'm on, you know, my blood pressure medication is is a factor too. So, uh, there, you know, it's it's the evolution of of medicine in that regard and. And just, uh, you know, we, what we've learned in terms of diet and exercise, I mean, if, if we're compliant and, and we do the work, there, there are going to be other portions of society, and, it's, and it, it spans the socioeconomics that from rich to poor that, that don't care or aren't interested and, and then suffer the repercussions still. Um, in regards to the in comment on Big Pharma, I was going to say, like, you know, sure, they may make a lot of money, but they spend a lot of money and yeah. have a lot of failures and they absorb that right. happily and quietly and say nothing to nobody. So I see it as, you know, both sides of the coin. So, yeah, then, I do too. I mean, I have yeah. uh, some friends who work at, at different pharmaceutical firms as, you know, research scientists and they've, you know, all been working their, their whole careers to try ver- find various cures for cancer and diabetes and, you know, yet without success. So it's, uh, 
it's, it, you know, there's, there's frustrations that come with that. They're not all millionaires that work there. It's, I, I, I think it's an easy target for politicians to say, look at the head of this, this uh, pharmaceutical company who makes $30 million a year. Well, you know, the president of, of plenty of other companies make the, the same amount of money, and, you know, they may just be for a good or a service or for, you know, MasterCard or something. I mean, they're not there trying to save your life. Or, uh, you know, why does George Clooney make $20 million for, for being in a movie? You know, I mean, maybe he makes me chuckle, but he's not – He's not, he's not helping me, you know, with my life expectancies, but we don't condemn that. Right. So uh, it, it's just easy to demonize an industry for to, to get votes. Uh, and, and, you know, it's it's uh, w- without looking at the other side. Um, uh, but I, I don't want to go get too political on you because we could spend the rest of the, the podcast on that. Um, where, uh, I, and I don't want to pontificate too much. So let me. You know, no give you the opportunity to speak. You know, why do you think uh, diabetes has been on the rise, though? I mean, we have now more tools to attack it with, but why is why has it risen? I I think that you know it's it's fascinating, really, because we have more medication. But again, it, it, what doctors on one panel that I I attended at scientific session said is. You know, people, it's, it's like somebody who get, well, I'll use a, a, a sports rec, reference. When Rex Ryan was coaching the Jets, he was really overweight. He got a gastric bypass and he didn't he end up looking that much better because he still ate the same crummy diet. So instead of having three pizzas, he had a half a pizza, but it still wasn't a good diet. And there are people that will maintain their bad diet and just think they could take more insulin or increase their metformin intake. And it's, it's not really a solution. So, you know, to off the, the, we're getting new drugs today, but people will, will offset or, or annul those, what those drugs do by, by eating poorly or not exercising. And, and then again, it goes to today's youth, which is far more sedentary than they should be because they've got their two thumbs working on a handheld device or they're just watching a lot of television and they're not out riding their bikes or they're riding some, you know, (laughs) one of those razor scooters that has a motor on it. I'm seeing kids with those. It blows my mind. Um, So there's that. And uh, I I think there's a lot of junk, too, that we eat still. And, uh, so where, where are the where are the big sources of improvement going to come from in your experience? From people like be, becoming autodidacts and and learning about their bodies and them and 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 themselves as individuals. The big problem I see today is we look at everything because it's what sells books and products as abstractions. So when you get some snake oil salesman that tells you, if you all follow my diet, yeah, everything's going to be great. Well, but I, I've spent time at Duke University's Diet and Fitness Center, which treats diabetics and obese people primarily. And their whole philosophy is could take five diabetics and they're all might have to follow specific different diets because different foods are going to affect you in different ways. I mean, obviously there are certain things you should and shouldn't eat, but you can't just take one person, 10 people, a thousand people or a million people and put them all on the same diet. That's not going to work. So, you know, we have to, uh, it, th- there again, I'll go back to what I said earlier. It fascinates me that you have people that are into, especially I don't get, I've never, I'm a, a sports fan, but I don't get fantasy football. You know, people that are spending a good hunk of their their week, like working on on a you know on a, a their own fantasy sports team, but they know nothing about their diet, their body, and what they're putting into their bodies. And uh, you know, it, it doesn't take that much time to to do some research and read some books or to to learn about. It's funny also when when people get a get a drug from a doctor. They're like, okay, I'll take it. Well, why not Google that drug then first and say, yeah, well, okay, I'll, I'll try this doctor, but what are the other options for me? And, you know, let me write them down and I'm going to read about all of them and see how they affect me. And, uh, it's true. um, I, I, I mean, I, I, 
I've also found like side effects can, can be really impactful. And, uh, I was able to wean myself from, from probably the oldest and most common diabetes drug called metformin, but it caused a lot of like physical aches and pains for me, which is one of the side effects. And now that I no longer take that, I feel much better. Hmm? You had, oh, you, while you were taking metformin, you had what kind of side effects did you have? Well, I didn't even realize how much the side effects were, were, were there. I thought maybe part of it was middle age, but just I, like my muscle da- muscles ached all the time and I had a lot of fatigue. And, uh, and another reason is, look, it's a, it's a medication that's been around for a while. It's easily prescribed and insurance companies approve it easily because it costs pennies, which is now another point that a, a doctor brought up at the, at a panel that I, th- that I hosted, which is, you know, we're short sighted in America. We don't want to approve a, an expensive medication, but if you put people on the best, most effective medications earlier in their life, 20 years later, they may not cost, cost Medicare, uh, you know, millions of dollars because of dialysis and, and, and other, other extreme treatments because they've, you know, they've, they've got severe complications from diabetes. I mean, there's, there's another problem that just comes with with lack of compliance from patients too is, you know, you, you get to a certain point and suddenly you're going to get really sick and you're over 65 and Medicare is paying for it. And we, we literally can't afford it. So while I'm not recommending a death panel, we, we have to look into a way to, to make people more compliant because, you know, again, not to get political, but promising health care for all is is not feasible when people are living longer and longer and longer and getting sicker and sicker and sicker and uh oh yeah i agree totally there in fact I, I, there are huge numbers which i can't quote because i don't have them in front of me of what diabetes is costing us and what it will if it continues what it will cost us in 10 years and it, it's it's just um, actually nuts. One, one way to put it is I think diabetes alone, I've, I've heard it referred to as like a tsunami. It's literally going to be a monster in terms of the amount of money it's going to suck up out of healthcare, right? That alone. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's not like, like even if you survive cancer, like, which my dad did, he got his chemo and like, you know, over the course of a year, he was cured. And it's like you know, diabetes is just an ongoing thing. And if it, if if you let it get worse, the complications are more extreme, and it can lead to, you know, when then when you involve obesity, there's heart disease, there's potential cancer, there's hip or knee replacement because you, your body can't handle the weight and uh, amputations. Uh, uh, it, it's just you're right. It is a tsunami, and uh, we're, you know we're not doing enough about it because we're reactive rather than proactive. So you have a politician that instead of saying, "Gee, we've got to do something about making our country healthy," they just say, "Don't worry. If you elect me, we're going to pay for everything." It's not really a great solution. So um, you've been around a lot of medical professionals. You've been at universities. You're going to conferences. Is the mood at the conferences and the presentations in general a hopeful atmosphere, or is it like we're screwed? Let's just do the best we can to mitigate this atmosphere. Like, what's it like? You know, I, I mean, the scientific sessions was really uplifting for me because it was great to interact with all these top doctors and researchers, research scientists who were like, okay, you know, you're two two diabetes ambassadors, myself and Hyvel Ferguson, like. How how can we work together? And what can we do in conjunction to to you know help people? Because I mean, doctors' big thing is oh, we tell our patients and they're non-compliant, and so we're like, well, okay, so you know we we understand that, but then here's what you could do as as a doctor. And also, what I really found was the the big pharmaceutical companies are, despite you know what what naysayers say, are really there to to try and do good and. Uh, I mean, besides sponsoring, I mean, I'll give you, Novo Nordisk has a uh, has sponsors a uh, a group of triathletes, but they're they're there to to educate and help people. And uh, um, 
I, I, I think they're all looking for, for ways to work in conjunction, like with the American Heart Association, to, to get the word out and spread the word. And, you know, they put me on a billboard talking about this and video billboard in Times Square. And uh, there's a strong uh, initiative there because it's not doing, you know, that we're finding ways to keep, keep people alive longer, but, you know, there, there, there means they're going to be sicker maybe by at, at a certain age. And it's, you know, those, those additional 10 years may not be good years unless we, we figure out a way to, to, to live, live our previous, our earlier years healthier. Yeah, there's the health span versus lifespan. Uh, you know, yeah. talk. What's the good of being old if the last twenty years of your life you're miserable and you're half dead? Right, and there are you know people who you know it's it. What is the quality of life those last? You know, it could be five years, ten years, fifteen years, but it's it. You know, it doesn't it doesn't have to be like that. And that, Dr. Grenieri from Columbia said a great has a, a great line that she used on me long ago, and I I discussed it at conferences, which she said, "If you could go back now to your 27 year old self, would he listen to you?" And it be, you know, and I said, you know, probably not, unless I had like a picture of myself where I had gained all this weight and like would it would have horrified me. But it it is very hard, and it's really important in the matter of conveyance and how we educate people and do it. You know, it's it's like I love Mike Bloomberg, but banning large sodas isn't going to teach anybody about how to take care of their bodies. They'll find an, find another way to poison themselves. You know, there's, there's, it, it's, it's taking the easy way out. It's, it's going to be hard work and, and take some thought from, from all parties to really help people learn about how to, how to be healthy and, and fit because it's something that's just, we, most of us don't have to address often until it's, it's too late. Yeah, that's what I was going to say when I think back to my younger self. I mean, you, if you feel fine, you just, you know, you don't worry about that stuff. You got other stuff you feel like you got to worry about. And then, you know, I thought, oh, I'll deal with it later. I'll worry about it later. But, you know, I think that thinking is unfortunately maybe pervasive. And some of the people that are lucky get warnings, you know, a curable cancer, uh, a minor heart attack, uh, diabetes, whatever it is. And then the ones that are unlucky, they just drop dead. But I think just the human psychology is that. It's hard to address these issues or feel like they're important unless you've been impacted. Yeah, and and it's also hard with specific things that you know you're gonna if you have psoriasis or something you're gonna see it on your arm. If you have diabetes, you don't physically see it. It's like uh, same with high blood pressure, which is known as the silent killer. You you don't understand what's happening to you internally, and high blood pressure is something that is is. Growing, I don't know how I call that epidemic rate, but I, I suffer from it. And uh, there again, it's you know, if you want to, you want to question a, a a large corporate entity. What about you know, certain food companies who, you know, there's salt in everything, and I understand it keeps gives you a shelf life. But when I went to Duke's Diet and Fitness Center, they have you on a literal no salt diet. And when I was there for a week, I didn't have to take a blood pressure medication. But, you know, conversely, out in the real world, living in New York City or anywhere else, really, if you're not if you're not cooking three meals a day at home for yourself, then you're going to be there's going to be a salt intake, no matter how diligent you are. So I, I and I don't metabolize salt well. So I'm on I take blood pressure medication as a result. And, uh, you know, it's it's. I mean, I know people who have who who do it, and but they don't go to restaurants. And they, even you know, there are certain breakfast cereals I eat that I find really healthy, but they have salt in them. So so th- that's going to be the negative effect on me. But then again, there are most breakfast cereals, which most people don't realize are completely sugar laden, heavy on refined carbohydrates, and there's a, and and they're yet. I, I think that's a big problem with our youth is people eat dessert for breakfast and they don't know it or they don't think about it. Or they have dessert for every single meal. You know, they have yeah, a, but, a cereal, I mean, a, Starbucks. Breakfast cereals, and it's funny, I won't name name the brand, but there's a cereal that advertises itself as heart healthy. 
And I've told people, why, why are you eating that garbage? Well, yeah, but it says heart healthy. It's like, you know, so, you know, <laughs> I'm sure there's some people that'll tell you how heroin is really makes you feel great. It doesn't mean that, uh, you know, it's not going to destroy your body. I mean, what, you, you know, it, it, it's, you, you can call anything, anything you want, but it doesn't mean it's good for you. And, uh, um, it's, you know, we went after like the tobacco industry in terms of our government, which I think was good, but there are things that, that are completely left alone that are, are, are really, I think, damaging our youth, especially in terms of sugared cereal is just, it, it shouldn't exist. And there's a thing that a, a doctor at Duke used to do where he'd come out with a huge bag of sugar and ask people if would they would pour this on any of their meals or in any of their drink. Of course, people would say no, and he would say, well, this is how much sugar is in a can of ginger ale or in this particular breakfast cereal. Mm. And it's just, you know, again, you don't see it. You don't, you know, read the label. But if you look at a, labels on, on things, and that's a big Duke, uh, they're big proponents of, of label reading at Duke. It's like, look at the label, see how much salt is in it, how much sugar is in it. I mean, I never w- uh, would buy buy a spaghetti sauce ever at a at a uh, at a supermarket. They're all there's enough salt in in a in a jar of spaghetti sauce to last you a, 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 you know a week of of all the food you eat. Huh. Well, I guess if you combine it with you know, like let's say for young people, so you combine feeling fine a lack of knowledge and the pervasiveness of bad food. I mean, this is what we get. I think yeah. it's like a, we're not, you know, we, we seem to, you know, while we seem to have made these jumps and leaps and bounds of, you know, knowing about food and having <laughs> craft beer and bottled water and or being woke about, about, uh, you know, gluten, uh, we still have pretty lousy diets. Mm. Well, very good. We're, um, we're close to being out of time, okay. actually. But what's um, so what what big things are you working on over the next couple of years, or what big things do you see coming? Any sea changes in, in diabetes? Um, I hope that the No but Diabetes by Heart program will will raise awareness in people. Uh, and I, I mean, I think living in New York, uh. It, which again, you know, when New Yorkers are forced to walk, I, I you know, in, in, I've got, you know, when I travel to other, other states and cities and I see people that are part of more of, of car cultures, uh, there's a lot more obesity there. I just, I think I, you know, it's, I'm on a mission to raise people's awareness. And, uh, I, I think, you know, while I'm not a proponent of big government, I think we're going to really need, a, a, you know, a poli- politicians at some point to instead of promising us the moon, that we'll really do something and say, I'm I'm going to institute a program or we're going to have some type of health awareness organization that the government contributes to instead of spending an extra billion on on you know, some other frivolous thing or promising you that we're, we're going to take care of you when put you in a nursing home that they do something preventatively. Uh, but, but I, I, I see the the future as positive because I see the organizations like American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association, and their various sponsors, which are numerous drug companies, pharmaceutical companies, uh, really working to, uh, improve people's lives. So uh, I feel good about it. Thanks, Rob. Well, I'm glad you're doing your part and uh, you're keeping yourself well and I appreciate you, uh, you know. Thanks so much for having me on the show. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, 
stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Thank you.